sir. That's me, 1967, and my sombrero from the Mexican Pavilion at Expo. It was a pretty exciting time, because this is when um, the world really came to Canada at just the right time when we were also uh, really reinvigorating the discussion about who we were and how we wanted to present ourselves to the world. A perfect time, really. A lot of energy that was created around that whole time. But that energy is um, hard to sustain, especially in a country like Canada. In fact, I would argue that it's harder to sustain that energy in Canada than it is anywhere else in the world. Every country has to have the conversation all the time about who they are. Um, but it usually travels much easier village to village, town to town, neighbor to neighbor. We have to build a tremendous amount of infrastructure to do that over a huge area, and it costs us more per capita than anywhere else. Not just to have um, the conversation, but to have the, uh, all the machinery that you need to facilitate the, just the simple dialogue about how you make cheese or butter tarts or uh, jokes or anything like that. So you've got to have roads and you've got to have railways and eventually you have to have broadcast towers and cell phone repeaters and you've got to have cable and you've got to have uh, institutions that deal with these things, railway companies and national broadcasters and the Canada Council. It's all worthwhile. It's really worth doing. But it means that it's all a very big structure that we have to maintain, whereas in other countries, it tends to happen a little bit more organically. It's important that we do it, though, because having that conversation is the essence of citizenship. Citizenship isn't just about hearing the story of a place and deciding to call it your own. It's about whether or not, especially in a country like Canada, you can contribute to that story, that it embraces you, it includes you. It's a very challenging thing, and we don't do it all that well. Because this is what we do. We use these as a shorthand to talk about ourselves, over and over and over again. And there's nothing wrong with any of them. But you know and I know that this isn't who we are. We're a way more diverse, way more interesting uh, group of people than this would suggest. In 1995, I set about on a mission to provide an alternative to these symbols. And after a lot of research, and with the inspiration uh, provided by a guitar maker bent on using Canadian wood, I began gathering these pieces that you see here. Now, I know they don't look like much, but that's because some of them aren't much. Some of these things are construction scrap, or picked up off the bottom of Halifax Harbor, or off of the tundra. Some of them are really famous. The point is that each and every one of these pieces tells a story, and each and every one of these pieces is part of this guitar. In total, I gathered 64 pieces for the project originally, 63 of those are in the guitar itself, there's a 64th on the strap that I'll show you a bit later, and I've since added a few to the case and strap as well. We officially nicknamed the guitar Voyageur at the Festival de Voyageur in Winnipeg in February of 2008. I'll say it again, people, Winnipeg in February. <laughs> you want to talk Canadian experiences, there you go. That's Lieutenant Colonel Susan Beharial of the Canadian Armed Forces who uh, suggested the name uh, Voyageur, so she came out there with us. So I can't show you all of the pieces, of course, but I can take you inside the guitar a bit, and show you what the project is all about. Over here, of course, we have the province of Quebec, and you may or may not know that the northern part of it is known as Nunavik. This is the Inuit territory of Quebec. Pretty sparsely populated in terms of people, very heavily populated in terms of caribou. Uh, so you can imagine caribou is a big part of life in Nunavik. Uh, diet, fashion, economy, culture, you name it. The singer Elisa P. Isaac introduced me to a young artist from Kujuak named Charlene Watt who carved for us this ulu, a women's knife. It's just a little ornamental one made from caribou antler with a couple little soapstone rivets in it. And this little ornamental ulu is now right in the middle of the fifth fret of the guitar. The guy holding the guitar in this picture just happens to be Charlene's father, Charlie Watt, who's a senator down the road here in Ottawa. He only find out, found out that his uh, daughter did this for us about an hour before we took the picture. Pretty sweet moment. Across the chamber from him uh, sits Nancy Green uh, in the Senate. Uh, in 1968, she wore this ski in Grenoble, France, when she was Canada's first multi-winter Olympic medalist. Uh, that ski is now a reinforcing strip on the inside of the guitar. And I can tell you that Nancy really, really got into the spirit of her donation to the project. 
Uh, we've kept in touch since. Uh, more than a hockey player, right? A cultural icon, a man on whose uh, fortunes, the whole fortune of the Francophone community in Montreal and beyond seemed to rest. Had kind of a rough year, though, in the 54-55 season when he was suspended by the league commissioner, Clarence Campbell. But when he came back the following year, there was no stopping them. In fact, they launched a series of five Stanley Cups in a row for the Montreal Canadiens and a new tradition because at the time, if you were on a Stanley Cup winning team, the league would give you a silver platter. It looked terrific at home, but you couldn't really show it off in the way that the Richard family wanted, so they commissioned for the whole team the very first ever set of Stanley Cup rings. This is the one they commissioned for Maurice himself. You can see his number nine there in his name. My friend Dave bought this ring at an auction in 2004 when the Richard family was getting rid of some memorabilia. Uh, he paid $8,000 US, which I know his wife thought was a mistake. Uh, and then he made the further mistake of telling me that he'd done this. And I begged and pleaded. We went down to the craft studio at Harborfront Center in Toronto where a young jeweler named Bevan Jennings cut off a tiny bit of gold from the bottom of the ring. You'd never know it's gone. It's now right in the middle of the ninth fret. So I actually like to think this looks like one of Maurice's eyes coming down the ice at you. Uh, the white of the eye is Moose Antler from Pick River First Nation on Lake Superior. The blue is Labradorite from Nain Labrador. And then that little pupil of gold right in the middle. This is part of the original gate that uh, blocked access uh, against the police at night at uh, Fantan Alley, Canada's first Chinatown in Victoria, BC. It's now an interior piece on the inside of the guitar connecting the uh, top and the sides of the guitar. On the, uh, what we call the pick guard assembly, this piece here is from the cabin of John Ware. John Ware was Alberta's first black cowboy, a very successful entrepreneur. Uh, and a brilliant, legendary uh, cattleman uh, honored with this stamp just last year. Uh, there's a bunch of pieces to show you, but I'll just show you the one that gets all the ooze. The leftmost piece in the stem of the maple leaf there is the top of Paul Henderson's stick from the 1972 Canada Russia series. There we go. You try telling that to a Sidney Crosby fan these days. They just don't get it. Um, there's two circles of copper around the rosette there. Those are from right down the road uh, from the roof of the Library of Parliament. And there's a couple more pieces of that copper. If you travel up the guitar to the third fret, you'll find them uh, embedded with some moose shin from Pachinac and some more Labradorite. If you turn the guitar over and have a look at the other side of it, uh, and you see the neck there, some more political pieces here. The center piece in the laminate is from the Manoir Papineau in Montebello, Quebec, uh, the seigneury of the great Quebec politician Louis-Joseph Papineau. Uh, we were welcomed there, uh, had full run of the house. I'm not sure Louis-Joseph really approved f uh, from this picture, but I think, he, I think he might have liked it if he could have stepped out of that picture just a little bit. Uh, traveling down the guitar a little bit, a bit more political history here. Uh, the two dark strips that you see there on either side of the light strips on the spine are a door frame from the center block of parliament. Uh, and all the rest of that beautiful tigery looking stuff is actually spalted oak. It's from the largest oak timber frame building in North America. Louis Riel once went to school there. It's now the St. Boniface Museum in Winnipeg. And when we returned there, they draped Louis Riel's Sacha Flecher around the guitar as a gesture of welcome, which still blows me away. Um, inside the guitar, some more political pieces. I'm the only saying this because it's Ottawa. The tone bar there is a canoe paddle that once belonged to Pierre Trudeau. Uh, and what we call the finger braces, these items here, are from a piece of furniture, possibly the sideboard, maybe bar, I don't know, of uh, Sir John A. Macdonald. Now here's the thing, as we take the guitar across the country, I'm not sure whether it's prime ministerial mojo or whether it's just the fact that it's easier to reach, but the tone bar is the one that a lot of people want to touch, especially women for some reason, I find. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, we do let contemporary politicians hold it as well. Peter McKay gave us one of our favorite politician rock star poses, uh, but it, we cover all political stripes, including those who keep us apart. Uh, that's, uh, we call that his Johnny Cash pose. And of course, Jack was a guitar player as well, so um, uh, brought it to life on several occasions. There are so many stories uh, in this guitar from so many communities that were real gifts from those communities who wanted to be part of it and wanted to participate. I can't tell you about too many more of them, but I'll tell you about one, because it's really quite spectacular. It has to do with the golden spruce. I don't know if you know this story. This is a remarkable tree, a completely albino Sitka spruce. 
spruce tree on Haida Gwaii that shouldn't have survived but lived for 300 years and grew to 120 feet tall. It was important to a lot of communities, but especially to the Haida community for whom this was a sacred tree said to contain the spirit of one of their ancestors, and they called it Kit Kias, the Golden Spruce. In 1997, a disgruntled logging scout wanting to make a point to the Macmillan Bledel Paper Company cut it down in the middle of the night. The Haida people I met said that for them, this was like a drive-by shooting. It was a murder of someone in their community, and they vowed never to touch it. For nine years, it stayed on the ground, but in February of 2006, a Haida carver named Leo Gagnon and an elder named Frank Collison took us into the forest and cut a piece for us. It's the only piece ever taken from that tree, and it's perfect. Most of that wood we left with Leo, he'll spend the next 15 years making things out of it. He's already made an extraordinary mask of the spirit of the tree. We took a sheet from that off the front. It's now the whole top of the guitar. It's really, thank you. It's really the face and the voice of the project and couldn't be any better. The guitar made its official debut here in Ottawa on Canada Day, in, on, Canada Day on Parliament Hill in the hands of Stephen Fearing, whose song The Longest Road I Had Dreamed for 11 Years would be the first song sung on it, and it was. But in fact, all of the guitar players who were on the bill that day uh, played, and we got invited back to the Canada Day celebrations here year after year for the next several and many other National Capital Commission events as well, including a winter lewd and a, a royal visit and that kind of thing. So um, we have a real home here in Ottawa that I'm very proud of. Uh, at this point, we've clocked about 300,000 kilometers going back and forth across the country and visiting all kinds of people, all kinds of events. And really the point is uh, to get this guitar into as many hands as possible. Something extraordinary happens when people encounter this thing and are faced with uh, something that includes them and resonates with them in different ways, uh, whether they play guitar or not. Um, and the real delight for me is the stories that I get back um, from storytellers and people whose story you know, but also from regular folks who often surprise me with amazing tales uh, that connect them to pieces of the guitar or people who have played it. Yeah, that was David Miller doing the other rock star pose. Um, believe me, I wanted Rob Ford to pose, but he couldn't do that, so. Um, musicians, though, bring it to life in a whole other way, because I can tell you about this project, and you can see the guitar and hold it, but when a musician gets their hands on it, something else happens. Some whole new dimension comes out of it, and that's because it kind of comes to life and what they want to say. Um, it's a weird thing to ask a guitar player to play a guitar that's not their own very personal instrument, but all across this country at all kinds of events, musicians from all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of styles have taken this moment to think about, well, what do I want to say while I have this guitar in my hands? And the results have been nothing short of extraordinary and um, a huge honor for me. Um, so we will hear some music from it. Uh, I'll tell you, by the way, that Stomp and Tom played Bud the Spud, in case you were wondering. Um, there's one other musician I want to talk about. Um, you know, we did talk about Chris taking this guitar up to space with him. It would have been amazing and very dangerous. Uh, plus, he already had one up there, this uh, little Larivee Parla guitar he's got. So before he went, instead of him taking my guitar, we got together and he played a couple of songs on this guitar. Uh, and then he presented me at the end of that meeting with his mission patch, which he actually designed himself. And you will notice that it's in the shape of a guitar pick. <laughs> On that note, I think we should hear a note or two from this guitar, and I'd like to invite Cindy Duar to the stage. <laughs> now, Cindy, uh, is a very, very brave person because although she's played this guitar on a couple of occasions at the Alliance Francaise in Toronto and a little bar on Queen Street as well, um, she's a southpaw, so she's actually going to play this upside down. And while she's doing that, I'm going to show you some of the portraits that we've taken. We've now taken about 150,000 official portraits of about 15,000 different people holding this guitar in every province and territory of Canada. And something amazing happens in these situations, too. This is um, uh, the, a white space that we create at festivals and conferences and other events. And people step into this space, first of all, not 
believing that they'll be allowed to touch the guitar, for one thing. And then we give them time. We take multiple photos and they're free and they become themselves. And at the same time, they are embracing this country that they have some sense of and they're also being themselves. And to me, that's the whole magic of what happens other than when great music comes out of it. Cindy Dwar. Actually, I'm just going to take a second um, to stage. Actually, this man standing for this right in this photo is Charlie Angus. And uh, he is the MP of uh, the Timmins James Bay uh, District, which is where I'm from. I'm a Franco Ontarian from Timmins. And he sent me this wonderful quote uh, yesterday saying that uh, Canada's greatest exports haven't been gas and oil, but our incredible artistic talents. And the Timmins James, yes. Thank you. And the Timmins James Bay area is so big. It is bigger than the United Kingdom. And that is how magnificent and massive our gorgeous country is. So it's an honor for me to be here. I'm going to play a song that was co-written with a Franco-Ontarian poet named Paul Savoy, and it's called Quand une vient de Quand on lui enlève ce pétale, il lui reste encore la S'il n'existe plus de port, il reste en de rivage au navire. Les vagues le percent encore, la perce encore à tout jamais à la dérive. Quand on lui enlève sa beauté, il lui reste un automne à l'été pour porter ses sandales trouées, pour couvrir de courant son beau visage fatigué. Tu ne vieilleras plus haut Quand t'es fou Je serai un écho plus Sans souci Traînant mes portes Dans les rues Je n'aurai plus rien 
Gorgeous. Um, since we were here at the Canadian War Museum and the Barney Dancing Theatre, there's a couple of things I just wanted to mention uh, that are part of the strap. Um, part of the original 64 pieces uh, were the shoulder tile and uh, insignia from the Princess Patricia's Light Infantry, uh, which celebrates its centenary next year. Uh, and then two years ago, we added uh, the shoulder tile and insignia from the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, founded in 1795. <laughs> I'm not sure what their next big anniversary is, really. Um, if you want to find out more about the project, there's lots online at sixstringnation.com, lots more depth that you can get into about the various pieces and the stories behind them, and connections to our social media platforms. And I gotta tell you, uh, there's this wonderful tribute. Uh, you know, I had a lot of trouble getting support for this project, uh, and then out of the blue came this wonderful offer from the Royal Canadian Mint to commemorate the project with a coin, uh, a 50 cent piece, that cost $34.95, I warn you. Um, uh, and they sold out, so if you find one, pick it up. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great to be part of these. Thank you so much.